Hey, everybody, on this edition of The Basement Breakdown, you got to give a little to get a little. Give me a minute and you'll get the details. Join me, John Tatey, as I have another Basement Breakdown. Okay, season five, episode three, the guy for this. Couple themes I want to draw out here in this episode. One, talking versus seeing. This episode really highlights Kim and Saul's ability to talk, to spin a story, um, and it contrasts them against antagonists who can see them through their words. This is also an episode that hinges on what you give and what you get, how much the characters have to give of themselves or otherwise, and how much they get back in return. These ideas crop up early in the episode in this garage scene. Okay, Saul's nervous. Lalo's giving him the silent treatment after he arrives. Saul says, Can I talk? I'll, I'll talk. There's a lot of talk about talking in this episode from Saul and Kim. And as soon as Saul says, I'll talk, we cut to this wide shot. Now look at the energy of the lighting here. Jimmy's standing in what looks like a spotlight. A if we weren't in a garage, you would almost expect him to be delivering this Shakespearean soliloquy. It makes it feel like more of a performance, which it is. Jimmy knows here that he's in too deep. He's now messing with cartel power players. Like, this is deeper into that red world, the criminal element, than he'd like. So he puts himself in this blue light, the light of the lawful world, right? And it's all, oh, I'm just a legitimate lawyer applying my trade. The light is tellingly weak, because Saul is clinging to the thinnest veneer of respectability. As it turns out, that's exactly what Lalo wants. We have these two other sources of light in the shot, too. Lalo's shop light and uh, the lights above Lalo's head. They're harsh. They're glaring. They're penetrating. The lighting here is conveying the intensity of Lalo's gaze even when he's not looking. Lalo's power to see is an essential part of the character, right? And if Lalo's power is his eyes, then Saul's power, as Lalo says, is his mouth. You're the guy with a mouth. Look how his eyes have both this piercing glow and this deep darkness when he delivers this line. Lalo has brought Saul here because he wanted to see the mouth. Look at the staging. Lalo pulls up a chair, spreads his legs. He makes himself the audience. This is a stance for seeing. And apparently Lalo likes what he sees, judging by the exchange that ends the scene. We see Saul coming up with a fee for his services. He rattles off a bunch of things he'll be providing, um, but he really has trouble coming up with a number. Seven thousand eight nine hundred uh, twenty five dollars what is Saul giving up here he's giving up some safety some self-respect he's giving up the ability to be honest about what he does with his life with Kim for instance what should he get in return for that well he has a hard time putting a price tag on it and we sort of see his greed and fear doing battle in his head as he sort of sputters out this ridiculous number as for Lalo, he just pays him whatever. Let's make it eight. Lalo can see how much Saul is worth. Saul can't. Saul's looking at himself as a lawyer. Lalo's just looking at him as a mouth. A mouth who can project Lalo's voice beyond the bounds of the criminal sphere. Are you talking to my client without his lawyer present? Then Saul goes up against our old friend, Hank Schrader. And man, I love these two scenes that reintroduce Hank and Gomi. Uh, you know, I might even shoot a separate breakdown uh, down the line for the Hank reintroduction here. It's such a great re-entrance for the character. But for now, I want to stick with the Saul thread. And the essential line in the interview room here is Hank saying, It's all good, man. <laughs> Really? Come on. That's your name? Hank sees through Saul immediately. Saul Goodman, those are just words. He's saying, I see you through the words. The takeaway for the audience is that Hank has seen the likes of Saul before, and we can see that Saul, who's already in deep on the red side, now is in the major leagues on the blue side too, right? He's messing with the elite, and he needs to up his game fast. And boy, can he feel it. Because Saul's theatrics don't work on Hank. Hank, leaning back in his chair, making himself the audience to the performance. He's not impressed. Hank is a professional. All he cares about, what is he going to get out of this transaction? So Saul ends up having to offer something of substance, a promise of information leading to arrests, right? He did his job, but he gave more than he wanted to give. And we can see this really weighs on him as we go to the act break. But... It turns out, Lalo doesn't really care. They're gunning for arrests. Okay. He's happy. And let's explore why he's so pleased. 
Both of these Lalo Saul scenes begin with images of Lalo fixating on his car. He's working on his car in the garage. Then on the racetrack, we watch him driving that same car. He's driving fast and he's driving in these big circles. Remember the spinning blade imagery from Lalo's visit to Fring's chicken cooler? Here we have another fast rotating image. That's the energy of both of these images, right? And the effect of the energy is the same. We're seeing and feeling Lalo's wheels spinning. And they spin fast, right? Tony Dalton's performance makes that clear. When Lalo gets out of the car, he is bursting with excitement over the new carburetor that has his car going faster than ever. I replaced the carburetor. She's running like a racehorse, man. The car is Lalo. The carburetor is Saul. Because think about it, now Lalo's eyes have a mouth. This is a big upgrade and Lalo is feeling powerful, like a racehorse, he says. And what is Lalo's favorite thing about his new mouth? Well, it emerges when Saul emphasizes how Crazy Eight is not actually a snitch. And, and remember that, Lalo, right? And Lalo's so bemused by Saul's concern. It's like, what do you care? Well, all due respect, you're paying me, but he's my client. I'd like to keep him alive. Lalo loves this because Saul's concern for another human being so clearly marks him as someone who is not of the cartel, who is not of their criminal world. This dude, good idea, he says to Nacho, and he says it in Spanish, even more clearly marking Saul as the outsider here. This dude is not one of us. Through Saul, Lalo can extend his power into that blue world, the legitimate world, where Gus Fring is so fluent and capable, right? Now Lalo feels like he has a toehold in Gus Fring's world, and that's why he's so excited. His car, the Salamanca operation, has been souped up by the addition of Saul. Saul's very valuable to Lalo now, and Nacho spells out what that means for him. When you're in, you're in. When you're in, you're in. A reality that Nacho knows better than anyone, as we see in this episode when he has that scene with his father. His father backed by the blue color and Nacho backed by the red. That was just a quick drive-by analysis of the Nacho scene. I'll leave the rest to you, because I want to turn now to Kim. Hey. We're going to find a lot of echoes in her storyline, of the Saul storyline. And we have this pair of balcony scenes that frames both of the hero stories, but it's, they're especially poignant for Kim here. To understand this first scene on the balcony, we're going to follow the beer bottle. Jimmy enters. He takes Kim's empty Oops. bottle. He sort of regards it for a second, then he sets it down oh. with a thunk. This subtly deliberate performance by Odenkirk and the sound design of that thunk of the bottle sort of subconsciously draw our attention to this prop. Then Kim focuses on the bottle, and to accentuate this, we have a rack focus from the bottle to Kim, from object to beholder. Kim looks at the bottle as if Jimmy took something from her. And you might say, well, hey, it's just a bottle. Um, it's practically nothing. He's doing her a favor. That's the point. She's so hypersensitive to what Saul's taking from her right now that even this little bottle sticks in her craw. Kim says she's drinking to celebrate. She's celebrating the upcoming day of pro bono work. No Mesa Verde. By the way, Jimmy is the one who got her the Mesa Verde account, although in awfully messy fashion, so he's hurt a little by this. But the point is that this bottle is imbued with the spirit of justice and light that Kim is anticipating in her upcoming day of work. Then she looks at the bottle again, and she practically glares at it. And I think she glares at it because she knows that the answer to the next question that's going to come out of her mouth is going to involve Jimmy slash Saul taking something from her, taking some hope, some optimism. It's going to subtract from that feeling of goodness that she's anticipating right now. What about you? Financially speaking, Saul Goodman just had his best day yet. And when Jimmy says Saul Goodman had this lucrative day and she just takes a moment huh. to imagine what that could be, she sort of nods her head like, yup, he just took another little piece of hope from me. Another little piece of hope just died, thanks to Jimmy and Saul. So when Kim leaves, she crosses past Jimmy in the frame, pretty aggressive staging. She snatches her empty and it sends two messages. One, don't do me any favors. Two, I'm not going to let you take anything from me. Judging by his reaction, Jimmy gets the message. The courthouse is where we establish Kim's internal struggle for this episode. The title of the episode is The Guy for This. And that applies directly to Jimmy's situation, but it's also a question of prime concern for Kim here. 
She wants to think that she's the guy for this, this benevolent, soul-nourishing legal work for the needy. What does she say to Rich Schweikert on the phone? Uh, my clients need me. I have a full day of appearances here. And her boss says, no, she's the guy for this, going out to the desert to talk with some Yahoo because their rich client is having a temper tantrum. It's the opposite of the pro bono stuff that she envisions for herself, right? Rich Schweikert's justification is, Once in a while you have to give a little to get a little, you know? Nobody knows this better than Kim. She's given a lot to get some. Before we leave the scene, I want to call out Kim's remark to her clients. She tells them if it goes to trial, she'll talk to the jury. And she says, you were trying to do a good thing. And I think they'll see that. This is Kim's ideal of how she operates. She talks and people see the good, the good in her clients, the good in Jimmy, the good in herself, right? This is sort of an archetype of how she wants to work. Keep that in mind as we visit Mr. Acker's neighborhood. Let's just appreciate this house for a moment. The red roof, the yellow fence. We know by now that these colors indicate that the house exists in transgression of the law. And there's this extreme otherworldly isolation that gives the house an almost mythical quality. The trees give the house a sense of age. It's been here for a long time. The empty foundations lead us to imagine all the other houses that were once there, and this is the only one that remains. All these details set the stage for Kim to encounter some elemental force, something allegorical, in the person of Mr. Acker. Stay right where you're at. He makes Kim stand at the gate. He pulls up a chair, he leans back, spreads his legs, and watches her show. Okay. Go ahead, talk. The staging really echoes the staging of Lalo and Saul in Saul's storyline. He's the audience, and she may begin the show. And after they have this back and forth about the contract, he starts to snipe at her. You people are all the same. You're just like the rest of them. She's annoyed by this, but okay, whatever. But then he says, And I can see you. I can see you. And his jibes penetrate deeper now because he tells her, well, she does good things just to make her feel better about the bad things that she does, the cynical things that she does. It's the exact accusation that Kim levels at herself. Wow, Mr. Acker really can see her. This shakes Kim. Look how Mr. Acker grows over the course of this rant. We have this shot that's pretty much on his level, and then later he's looming over us from this low camera angle. It really shows us the power that Mr. Acker suddenly has over Kim. In the car, two things I want to call out in this scene. First, I want you to note the flow of this conversation. Good. What about Ingram? He didn't show. Did you call all three numbers? Kim needs to feel like she's essential to these needy clients back at the courthouse, right? That she's the guy for that. She fixates on what seems like this inconsequential glitch and really makes it seem like, oh, she needed to be there. But she can hear that she didn't need to be there. She's not the one guy for what's happening back at the courthouse. Even she can see that her associate handled the workload fine. The other thing I want to call attention to in this scene is just the sound editing, how the revving of the engine is present throughout. And it makes it feel like the lead up to Kim's crash at the end of season three. A bit of a misdirection because she doesn't crash. She pulls over, she looks in the rear view mirror and decides she has to go back. Mr. Acker? And remember, this comes after Kim's speech to Mr. Acker about how you can't make your own rules, the law is the law. She was talking to Saul as much as Mr. Acker in that exchange, right? Well, now here she is breaking and entering. Really like to talk to you. Again, we're talking about talking, and it's true. She really wants to talk to him because like Jimmy, she feels that she can solve anything if she talks enough. She can make Mr. Acker see the good in right what outside. she's presenting like if she just keeps here. talking. Acker has only two lines in this whole scene. It's a kind of long scene, but he only has two lines. Line number one. Say what you came to say. Say what you came to say. And she does for two minutes. We watch her act out the whole show that she's rehearsed. And we watch the act devolve. She shows him the houses where she wants him to live, just like Jimmy did in 50% off, right? She says she won't pretend to understand what Mr. Acker's feeling, and then she proceeds to do just that, pretend. And when she says that little Kim's toes used to turn blue. My, to my toes turn blue. When she arrives at that word blue, that is the moment where Kim sees herself in that blue light of moral right and wrong. It's also the moment where she's conjuring this disfigured version of her youth. It's a moment when she's truly debased herself. She's my judging herself in this blue light and we can see her wither under it. We can see it in Ray Seahorn's performance here. And Acker can see her too. 
And so we arrive at line number two. You say anything to get what you want, won't you? You'll say anything to get what you want. Not a lot to analyze there. He said it. What did she want? Two things. She wanted him to see her as a good person, and she wanted the win for Mesa Verde. And she goes, 0 for 2. And so we reconvene on the balcony for balcony scene number two. There's no dialogue in this scene. I love this choice because there's nothing left to say. Both of these characters have spent the whole day talking and talking and talking, and yet feeling like they're just sliding backwards further into despair. The last thing they want to do right now is talk. For all the distance between them, Kim and Jimmy have always been really good at occupying rock bottom together. They're good at consoling each other when they hit bottom. They really seem together in this scene, sharing, not talking. Uh, it brings to mind me the scene in the first season of the two of them sharing a cigarette in the basement of HHM. Very similar energy here. They really seem together. Then Jimmy plays with his beer bottle, almost dropping his beer, then catching it at the last moment. And this is a Jimmy pattern. He goes right up to the edge of destroying himself and then, oh, snatches himself back at the last moment. <laughs> Kim right now feels like she has nothing left, nothing left to give, nothing left to lose. So she basically says, you know what, Jimmy? Sure, blow it up. What do I care? And Jimmy's reaction is, well, if Kim will blow it up with me, then sure, I'll blow it up because he just needs to be together with her. And so they experience this moment of togetherness this moment of catharsis at rock bottom, but we kind of know that this energy can't last. That's your breakdown. Hey, if you made it this far, you probably had a good time, so please subscribe. Now, I know you might be saying, what about that ice cream cone? Well, the ice cream cone is an image that has so many threads, it's gonna get its own video, so stay tuned for that. Hey, thank you so much for the supportive comments you've been leaving, it means a lot to me. Thanks to Brendan Leonard, my cameraman and my editor, who uh, comes up with some great B-roll, he finds the right shot to match my analysis, he makes me look really smart. Thank you, Brendan. Subscribe, subscribe, subscribe. I'll see you next time. Bye for now.